Okay, I think everyone's had a few minutes to get in here. So um, thank you all for coming. I'd like to introduce you to um, uh, Jeff uh, Gillido. Uh, he's come today to talk to us about probing the Proterozoic and Paleozoic record of Earth's oxygenation history. Um, Jeff got his PhD in 2013 from the University of Tennessee uh, with Linda Kay, who some of you may know. He worked on carbon cycling and ocean redox stratification during the Mesoproterozoic. After that, he taught uh, Earth's system history at Bucknell University. Uh, and then he did a Carlsberg Foundation postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Copenhagen, um, where he used chromium isotopes to study the oxygenation of Earth's atmosphere during the Mesoproterozoic. He then went on to do an NAI postdoctoral fellowship at the ANBAR lab at uh, ASU. And he explored uh, nitrogen and transition metal cycling in low oxygen greenhouse oceans um, using redox proxies, metal abundances, and molybdenum nitrogen isotopes. And now he is near us uh, since August. He has been a new associate, uh, new assistant professor at uh, George Mason University. So thank you for coming. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob, for inviting me. Uh, had a lot of fun talking so far today with people, and it'll be a fun afternoon as well. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about sort of what I'm interested in. Um, which is the buildup of oxygen in the Earth's system, in the Earth's oceans and atmospheres over geologic time. Um, it's been sort of one of the most important stories in our planet's history. It's fundamentally um, affected the evolution of life. So if we look at sort of our planet's history and the story of oxygen in our planet's history, there are some uh, inferences that we've made from both the geological and geochemical records over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, that have led us to some pretty solid theories and hypotheses. Number one is that in the early part of Earth history, it seems that oxygen in the atmosphere was very, very low. And there's a, a number of lines of geological evidence for that. For example, this is a mineral called pyrite that's found in ancient river deposits, which is only possible if oxygen was really, really low in the atmosphere. And we also um, see evidence for low, at, low atmospheric oxygen coming from the record of sulfur isotopes. Um, and then what about oxygen in the oceans? So the oceans during this time are also thought to have been almost entirely anoxic without oxygen, and particularly iron rich. And we see evidence for this from the different um, iron formations that we see that deposited in the deep ocean, as well as other types of sedimentary geochemistry. And then there seems to have been this major event that occurred about 2.3, 2.4 billion years ago when we first started to see sort of the appreciable buildup of oxygen in Earth's surface environments. It's a really famous event called the Great Oxidation Event. The period after that, though, is a period that we really don't know a huge amount about. And I've focused a good deal of my career so far on that interval, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but this interval afterwards, the sort of two billion year interval after the Great Oxidation event, we have pretty poor constraints on atmospheric oxygen. Some people think it was exceedingly low, almost like Archean levels. Others think it was, it was a good deal higher, but still lower than today. In the oceans, we seem to see evidence for oxygenated oceans at times, evidence for anoxic oceans that contained hydrogen sulfide, evidence for anoxic oceans that contained iron, uh, all coexisting, so it seems that ocean redox was probably quite heterogeneous during this time. So again, we don't really have a good constraint on that. And then there seems to have been a second transition, where we move toward a sort of moder more modern, oxygenated world. And the timing of that is also quite controversial and not very well understood. So I'm going to talk about some new lines of geochemical evidence that we can use to help pin down some of these questions, like what's going on in here? When did this happen? And things like that. Why is this important? This is important because um, people have noticed a long time ago that there seems to be um, sort of a first order relationship between the evolution of complex life and Earth's oxygenation history. For example, prokaryotes go back to the very early parts of the geologic record. Um, the first evolution of eukaryotes is uh, quite controversial as to when that exactly happened. But it seems to have happened sort of broadly coincident with the Great Oxidation event. And then this transition to the more modern oxygenated world seems sort of broadly coincident with the evolution of metazoans, of animals, uh, larger organisms that have high oxygen requirements. 
So understanding Earth's um, oxygenation history is really critical for understanding sort of the coevolution of life and environment um, that led to the different patterns of evolution and diversification of animals and early eukaryotes. So how do we actually get at this? And there's a number of lines of sort of geological, geochemical evidence that we put together to try and solve this puzzle. So geochemical proxies, right? We're looking at an ancient atmosphere or an ancient ocean. We can't directly sample that, right? It's long gone. So we have to look at something that's left behind in the rocks that tells us about that ancient ocean or that ancient atmosphere. Specifically something about the chemistry of those rocks, right? So some of the proxies that we use, we can look at shales, right? Really fine grained siliciclastic sedimentary rocks and look at the speciation of iron in those rocks, which tells us about the amount of oxygen present in the local environment at the time of deposition. Different redox sensitive transition metals behave differently under oxygenated conditions versus sulfide or iron rich. And their abundances in certain types of rocks can tell us about oxygen as well. There's also a lot of data now from the past 50 or so years on light stable isotope techniques. The carbon isotope system has given us a huge amount of information about Earth history as well as the oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur isotope systems, which are all intimately sort of tied to Earth's redox evolution. And we measure those ratios in a number of different types of rocks, limestones, shales, uh, a number of different types of marine sediments. Now, in more recent years, we've looked at some newer techniques, right, which are kind of possible now because of advances in mass spectrometry. Um, where we can measure very, very small mass differences between heavy element isotopes. And we're learning about how these new systems can tell us new information, right? So what are some systems that are used in sedimentary geochemistry in understanding redox evolution related to metal isotopes? One um, is the molybdenum isotope system, which has sort of been used for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, people measure it in fine-grained siliciclastic sedimentary rocks like shales. And it's given us a good bit of information about Earth's redox history. It definitely has its issues, as all of these proxies and, and the proxy I'm going to talk about today, we're going to see what sort of the strengths and weaknesses of that as well. Another system that is um, being used more frequently in the last five years is the chromium isotope system, which uh, has a sort of a range of different controversial kind of interpretations right now about ancient atmospheric oxygen. But the system I'm going to talk to you about today is the uranium isotope system, which is sort of, and I'll make this argument, is sort of becoming one of our more premier redox proxies um, that seems to work really well when it's applied to ancient carbonate rocks, limestones, and dolostones. It seems to track ocean oxygenation pretty well. And there's a number of sort of theoretical and underpinnings behind that and studies of modern environments that lead us to really being able to understand this proxy. So I'm going to show us a, sort of a couple of different applications of this and see what we can learn. So, right, uranium-238 and 235. How does this system actually work? So we express this, as we do in a lot of isotope systems, in uh, delta notation, where we compare the 238-235 ratio of a sample to a standard. Now, um, uranium has uh, two common oxidation states in nature. It sits as uranium-6, which is generally soluble in modern seawater. It forms complexes with calcium carbonate, and it sits as a soluble species. Um, and reduced uranium-4, which is particle reactive and gets removed to sediments. A good thing about this system is that uranium has a relatively long residence time in the modern oceans compared to the ocean mixing time. So its composition, or, or yes, its concentration and isotopic composition is homogeneous in the modern oceans because it's well mixed. So the oceans have a uniform isotopic composition, and we'll come back to sort of the details of this in a bit, of about minus 0.4 per mil. People have measured this all over the world, and it and tends to check out. So this is a good system because it gives us a chance of getting sort of a global picture of what's going on, because it's homogenous across the oceans. So let's look at some different sources and sinks um, that affect this system and sort of underpin its utility in um, redox proxy application. So you've got seawater sitting here. Sorry. There we go. 
Got seawater sitting here at about minus 0.4 per mil. This is sort of the range of different isotopic fractionation that we see in surface environments. And you've got a number of sinks here that sort of fractionate uranium isotopes a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit coming up about carbonate sediments, fractionation during carbonate sediment precipitation. There are small fractionations associated with hydrothermal alteration of mid-ocean ridge basalts and things like that, formation of iron manganese oxides, and suboxic sediments, low oxygen but low sulfide settings like the modern Peru margin, for example. All of those environments, when uranium is incorporated from the seawater into the sediment, there's a relatively small isotopic fractionation. By far the largest fractionation, the largest process that fractionates uranium isotopes is removal to anoxic sediments. So euxinic here, what that means is when you have anoxia combined with hydrogen sulfide present. That's euxinic. And if we look at places where that happens today, like the Black Sea, right, it's an anoxic sulfitic basin. Um, other basins around the world, like the Cariaco Basin, measure uranium isotope fractionation between the water and the sediments. That's where we see this big fractionation. So we can look at modern environments, different types of um, experimental studies to understand what's the magnitude of that fractionation. If you do microbially mediated uranium reduction experiments under anoxic conditions, right, you can start pulling out the heavy isotope with a fractionation factor of that, between about 0.7 and, and 1 per mil. Right? And it's important to note that the anoxic sediments pull out the heavy isotope. And here's the fractionation factor that we see the maximum observed in the Black Sea and the Saanich Inlet, which is another euxinic, modern euxinic basin. So this is really what underlies sort of the, the, uh, the utility of this proxy. Okay, so you've got your seawater just as a conceptual model sitting with an isotopic composition over here for about minus 0.4 per mil. And you've got anoxic sediments pulling out that heavy isotope. So if you increase the amount of anoxia in the oceans, you make more anoxic sediments, you're going to start to pull out more and more of that heavy isotope, which is going to drive the residual seawater toward the lighter isotope. And that's really the main concept behind uh, the utility of this proxy. So it, makes, it gives us a prediction, right? And it's that during an episode of widespread ocean anoxia in the past, you should see the uranium isotopic composition of seawater driven toward light values. All right, so more anoxia pulls out more heavy, pushes the seawater toward the light side. So this is a prediction that we can set up and maybe test from the geologic record. Right? Um, but seawater should go light when anoxia increases, a basic prediction. Of course, as I said before, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, we think that, um, that there's a probably good argument to be made that because sort of post-GOE at least, um, that the, the general composition of the upper continental crust hasn't necessarily changed dramatically over the last two and a half billion years, and that you're sort of at an atmospheric oxygen level where you're able to do that weathering reaction. Um, I think that there's a fairly strong argument to be made that Rivers were probably relatively where, close to where they are today. Um, you know, that's debatable, but, but that's, that's an assumption that particularly goes into our models that we'll, that we'll see later. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, the application of this in the Archean is a little bit more controversial. Um, that's not something that I'm going to be talking about, but, um, but yes, but that's a good question. Um, so as I said there, uh, we can't actually go back and measure the ancient seawater, right? So we have to look at the rocks. So what rocks should we look at? And there's growing body of evidence that shows that actually carbonate rocks, carbonate sediments, are a good record of ancient uranium isotopes. So this is just a picture um, of the modern Bahamas, for example, from the satellite image, right? which is a sort of a modern analog for a carbonate environment. So 
people look at the modern Bahamas and get at a whole bunch of different processes. What happens when carbonates form? How do they incorporate uranium? Do they, do they fractionate the isotopes? What happens when they get buried? What happens during diagenesis when these rocks get changed? Right? So we can understand how carbonates work by looking at a modern platform like this. So there's some, there's some good news and some bad news. Number one, if you look at the modern Bahamas at primary carbonate precipitates, you go up to a piece of coral. Right? You go up to a chunk of green algae. A primary precipitate. It matches the seawater uranium isotopes really well. And people have also done inorganic precipitation experiments to show that they match pretty well as also. So primary precipitates do seem to effectively capture the uranium isotopic composition of seawater. But early diagenetic phases, for example, if you've got just loose sediment sitting around, you do a shallow box core, right, and you measure those, they all tend to be just a little bit heavier than seawater. And we think the reason for that is that if, during early diagenesis, there's anoxia in the pore waters, you can incorporate a little bit of heavy uranium-4 into the sample, pushing the whole thing a little bit heavier. So we think that this kind of offset here is, an in, is something that occurs during sort of early anoxic diagenesis. Um, but the good news is that if we go and look at, for example, three different cores way down into the Bahama carbonate platform, a lot of these cores have aragonite, calcite, some even early dolomites that formed in, in uh, contact with seawater. They all basically sit in that same range, somewhere around 0.3 per mil heavier than seawater. So yes, it's offset. For example, right, we can't look at the sediment and exactly get the seawater value. But the good news is that it seems like this offset is relatively consistent. And it's not really dependent on the depth of burial or even on early changes in mineralogy. It seems more that if diagenesis is occurring in the presence of seawater, you're able to preserve that signal. Um, so carbonate sediments, I think, can be, and I'll show some more evidence for this, be a reliable archive for seawater, provided that um, we avoid samples that have been extensively altered outside of the seawater realm, right? Um, rocks that have seen meteoric fluids or deep burial diagenesis, those are going to be messed up. So we want to avoid samples that have been extensively altered by non-marine fluids. And when we're looking at the exact value, when we're trying to actually get at seawater, we need to consider this correction, right, that we see based on modern environments. So one of the best case studies that we've seen, right, I mean, another way to test this is go back in the geologic record and say, like, we're going to measure four different places around the world at the exact same time, and we're going to see if we get the same answer. Because if this works, we should get the same answer, right? So people have looked at the mass extinction event that occurred at the end of the Permian period. Across the Permian and Triassic uh, boundary, there was a huge mass extinction event. Um, it's recorded in different carbonate sections across the globe, some from the Atlantic, some from the Pacific. So four different sections worldwide basically show identical uranium isotope patterns. Namely, that there's a sharp shift toward lighter values, which indicates more anoxia, immediately associated with the extinction horizon. So number one, um, I think that that's strong evidence that um, if we're looking at sections right, that, that um, are not heavily altered, we can actually record a good seawater signature because we're getting a consistent result across you know, thousands of kilometers sections apart. So it is giving you a global signal. And right, people have hypothesized before that this extinction was actually because of anoxia. So there's some support for that hypothesis as well in these data. So I'm going to go back to our sort of broad story here that I talked about and see if we can look at a couple of these little problems and if we can apply uranium isotopes and learn something new. So the first one I'm going to talk about um, is this later transition to a sort of more modern oxygenated world. When did this occur? Uh, what's the timing of that? Uh, and things along those lines. So let's focus in on this interval here from about 600 million years ago to about 300 million years ago, right? And sort of the, 
you know, thinking about the geologic time scale, you've got everything before the Cambrian is the pre-Cambrian, this sort of great first seven-eighths of Earth history, and then going into the Paleozoic here. So we know that during this time, there were right, undoubtedly major changes in Earth's biosphere. We see the evolution of the first purported animals in the fossil record, known as the Ediacara biota, happens around 600 million years ago. We see the Cambrian explosion, where basically all of the modern phyla right, that, are, that are around today originated during the Cambrian, during the early Cambrian. And then we see another event called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, which is where ecosystems sort of align themselves in more sort of modern style. Right? So in this interval here, spanning 150 million years, we see going from a world with no animals to a world that had very complex marine ecosystems. So clearly, um, there were some very major changes to the biosphere occurring during this time. And it's long been sort of hypothesized that this had to do with ocean oxygenation. Right? So a number of uh, major studies. Oxygenation of the deep oceans during the late part of the Neoproterozoic in here, right, leading to the rise of animals. Rise to modern levels of ocean oxygenation coincident with the Cambrian explosion. Right, this has been a, a persisting hypothesis in uh, geobiology, this linkage between the rise of oxygen and the evolution of animals. So, and there's a, there's a good amount of evidence that this may actually be the case. Right? There are major changes in the carbon and sulfur cycles that are recorded in this interval. There's an expansion of the reservoir of different transition metals in seawater at this time. And there are some new proxies, even some other uranium isotope studies, um, that argue for oxygenation here. But the question is, was that oxygenation unidirectional? Or was it a transient episode and was this sort of more of a back and forth thing, right? And as we've looked more and more at the fossil record and the geochemical record, um, we've sort of come upon a little bit more of a refined hypothesis. So what if, for example, this oxygenation back here in the late Neoproterozoic was actually only transient? And that widespread ocean anoxia may have persisted well into the Paleozoic. So there's some evidence for this now, and the evidence is sort of piling up in favor of this hypothesis. For example, we see evidence for widespread anoxia and euxinic conditions in the later Cambrian. Same in Nordivision. Other studies showing it in the Silurian as well. So there doesn't seem to be a one-to-one -one linkage here between a permanent rise of oxygen and the evolution of animals. Oxygen may have had something to do with it, but there were clearly broadly anoxic oceans even after animals evolved at times which is a little bit weird. But it brings us to the question, OK, when then did we actually achieve a more modern style oxygenated ocean in a sustained way, sort of for the first time in Earth history? When did this occur? And there's sort of becoming hints now in the geological record that this may have happened during the Devonian period. Um, that comes from some molybdenum isotope evidence and from some sort of recent papers in the last few years looking at iodine, calcium, and cerium anomaly proxies. So there's sort of a hint, or at least a suggestion in the literature, that you know, the real major second Earth oxygenation event actually occurred during the Devonian period. That actually shouldn't be all that surprising, because the Devonian period is the time when land plants really took off in Earth history. So you had sort of little shrubby guys back in the Silurian, but through the early Devonian here to the late Devonian, um, we saw the evolution of sort of low shrub plants to more deeply rooted land plants and even having the first forests. So the Devonian marks a major change in terrestrial flora, right, which affects biogeochemical cycling by affecting weathering, by generating oxygen to put into the atmosphere. So it does make sense, right, that the evolution of land plants should right, um, oxygenate the world in some way, right? So this is sort of a modeling study from a few years ago that argued that, you know, this is the smoking gun. This is when it happened. The earliest land plants created modern levels of oxygen. So 
can we actually test this using our uranium isotope proxy? Um, so can we basically go to a place in the world where we have really nice deposits from the Devonian, continuous deposits of limestone, and sample them at high resolution and see if we can actually record this oxygenation event and pinpoint this is when it happened, this is how long it took, something like that. So we've attempted to do this by looking at the record of the Devonian in the western U.S. So here in the eastern U.S., um, rocks of this age are really heavily faulted and folded because of the Appalachian mountain, mountain building events. In the western U.S., in what we call the Great Basin, we have much more continuous records of the Paleozoic. And there was a huge carbonate platform that sat sort of through uh, western Utah and into Nevada during the Devonian. And we see a relatively continuous record from the lower Devonian up into the early Mississippian uh, recorded in, in quite well-preserved limestones of the western U.S. in the Great Basin. So our study sort of was about going to different spots around in Nevada, tying together the rocks based on biostratigraphy, and building a composite section that records this whole interval, and then seeing if we can apply our proxy and identify a change in ocean oxygenation. So a lot of our work that we did for the past two summers uh, was in a sort of unforgiving place in the middle of nowhere, right in the center of Nevada called the Antelope Mountains uh, near the town of Eureka. And we have some other sections from sort of shallower water deposits in Utah as well. But a lot of this composite section was sort of built in the Antelopes, right? And, and just for people that don't think about sedimentary rocks very much, right, if we go to one mountain range and we collect some rocks, we go to another mountain range, the way that we can really tell how those sections relate in time to each other is based on the fossils they contain, and a technique called biostratigraphy. So here's some pictures that we took from the, from the antelopes, just to get you a feel. Here's some sort of uh, what we would call a skeletal pack stone or grain stone full of uh, gastropods and crinoids and stuff like that. Um, here's some evidence for bioturbation, little burrows, and here's a, 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 a um, a bioturbational structure called zoophycus, which is a feeding trace that goes along the base here. So anyways, these are sort of the common biological features that you see in Devonian carbonates worldwide. And our composite section that we built through the antelope range, um, we do that based on there's a little fossil that's called a conodont. And it's used for biostratigraphy because you find a certain species of conodont, it tells you exactly what time the rock was deposited. So, we build all these sections together based on conodont biostratigraphy, and then all of a sudden we have our timeline, right? Okay, so then we did some geochemical analysis. Here's the carbon isotope record that we get from this. Um, carbon isotopes are, are really commonly used for stratigraphic correlation and um, learning about the carbon cycle in Earth history. So this, this section that, this, that we got here basically matches the global record very well, so that tells us some confidence that these rocks are not very heavily altered. Here's our uranium isotope signal. So what we see is very light values, down to about minus 0.6 per mil, minus 0.7, through the lower Devonian, right, in the Progean and Emsian, and then a sharp shift toward heavier uranium isotopes right here in the lower part of the Iphilian, in the middle Devonian, and then sort of staying with a little bit of noise toward the heavier side up into the upper Devonian. So if we remember, based on this proxy, that the heavier isotopes in seawater mean more oxic, the lighter mean more anoxic, what we've got here is a record of a pretty sharp ocean oxygenation event occurring in the lowermost middle Devonian, in the Iphilian. So that's actually really, um, really exciting because people have predicted, as I said, that, you know, land plants were evolving, things were happening biogeochemically. There should be, right, maybe, maybe the big ocean oxygenation in Earth history, right, uh, post-GOE, actually occurred in the Middle Devonian, somewhere around 400 million years ago. So by building this composite section here in Nevada, right, and, and we could then, you know, maybe a future study would be to go somewhere else in the world and see if we get the same answer, right, that would be good. Um, but based on this study in Nevada, we have pinpointed this major oxygenation to 
the lower middle Devonian, right around 395. Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, for sure. So uranium concentrations, um, well, there's a lot to say about uranium concentrations. They tend to be uh, specific to sort of the facies. Different types of pack stones and grain stones will have different uranium concentrations than the deeper water, like uh, carbonate mudstones and rhythmites and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, really go covary at all with the isotopes. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think that's a great point. I mean, what, what we need to do, I mean, what we're trying to do is build the entire Paleozoic record. I mean, the, the, we have uranium isotope data from the late Cambrian. We have some from the, from the latest Ordovician. We have nothing from the Silurian yet. Um, so, you know, it, it makes sense with the prediction that you might expect oxygenation here, but, you know, were the oceans oxic in the Silurian? It's certainly possible. Right, and that's, that's something that needs to be tested with more complete sections. I mean, the, the, the thing that we run into with this proxy is that it's new enough and it's expensive. Right, so, so you know, you want to ha you, how do you write into a grant filling up the whole Paleozoic when you need to do high enough resolution? Each data point costs us 200 bucks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's sort of the long-term goal, though, to be able to say, okay, is this really the event? You know, we need more context to be able to say that, but that's a great point. So a Devonian oxygenation event, right? Um, it makes sense, right, because it sort of occurs right in this interval here between lower and middle Devonian, which is uh, a major change in um, the evolution of rooted land plants, OK? So, right, so at least what we have here is we're able to use this proxy to just add another line of evidence in here, you know, that, that's sort of building toward understanding this history. Yeah. Right, right. Right. And Right. And 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 I think so so I mean there's two points there I think and and I'll show you show you with some modeling that we've actually used to try and say okay how much of the ocean was actually anoxic. Um, this proxy is not going to get you directly at atmospheric concentrations. Our best bet for that so far has been the geocarb sulfur models that people have done. Um, people have used fossil charcoal, for example, that say you can't make, you can't have a forest fire if you're below 15% atmospheric oxygen. That, um, that record tends to show also indicates that atmospheric oxygen was sort of in the range of maybe 10% in the Cambrian and Ordovician, getting us up to 20% through the Silurian and the, and the Devonian. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, th I think it's important to sort of take, you know, an atmospheric proxy and then tie it to an ocean proxy and see, are these systems coupled and those sorts of things. Um, so, so that sort of brings me, like, this is scary, obviously, so we're not going to get um, crazy into this, but what you can do is you can play games with isotope mass balance modeling, right? If you know something about the rate at which an isotope is going into the anoxic sediments versus the other sinks, right, you can make a back of the envelope calculation to tell you, okay, if the seawater composition is X, then what fraction of total uranium is being removed into the anoxic sink versus the other sinks? And then you can use rate constants based on modern environments to say, okay, how much then of the global seafloor was actually anoxic versus oxic, right? And there are a lot of uncertainties in these models, but we can at least do some back of the envelope calculations. Many of the uncertainties, for example, what's the fractionation factor associated with anoxic removal, right? Because remember, we looked at the, the microbial experiments, the different environments, it's a variable. So for our models, right, we, we use the, we'll just use a range and, and test the different, the test, you know, what comes out. Another um, uncertainty in these models is these rate constants that we use that are uh, 
related to uranium burial rates in different types of sinks, anoxic versus oxic sediments and things like that. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said here, but just for some of the ballpark calculations I'm going to show you in a minute, right, we just, you know, use some, some of the most conservative values that, that is going to give us a maximum estimate. Um, so, if you do just a, the, you know, a range of back of the envelope calculations based on isotope mass balance modeling, you come up with something like this. During the lower Devonian, Pragian and Emsian, half or more of the global seafloor was probably anoxic. In order to get the seawater to that value, after that oxygenation event in the Iphilian and Gavedian in the middle Devonian, you're making it so it's less than 8% of the seafloor is anoxic, much more modern looking. All right, so it's not meant to take this as the gospel, but it's meant to say, you know, however you sort of slice it mathematically, it shows that this was a major event, right? And it was a major um, increase in the seafloor area of oxic conditions. So in the last part, um, I'm going to sort of show us a little bit of a second case study here. Um, another time when we might want to use this proxy to actually learn something. And that is in this guy here. So after the great oxidation event and before that modern transition. And we know increasingly, or you know, we know very little about this time period, right? There's these broad estimates. Uh, atmospheric oxygen could have been very low, could have been a bit higher. We know it was probably lower than today. How much of the oceans were anoxic? Because it sure seems like most of the oceans must have been anoxic, um, but there's evidence for oxygen in some places, evidence for hydrogen sulfide, other places, iron in other places. So it's generally assumed that you're looking at a much more anoxic world than today, but we know very little about this world. So what can uranium isotopes tell us there? Again, why is this important? This is the interval before the evolution of animals, right? So you can sort of play the reverse game and say like, okay, well, why weren't there animals during this time, right? Um, so eukaryotes, there's a long fossil record of eukaryotes, single-celled algae and things like that, um, but a much shorter fossil record of animals. So um, this interval in here, it's very critical to understand, you know, was oxygen stress or hydrogen sulfide stress an important player in um, determining sort of the trajectory of animal evolution. So we have a number of field sites we're working on here. I also go up and get samples from different collections, um, but I spent a field season up in Arctic Canada, which was a lot of fun, up on, uh, on Baffin Island, on the northern part of Baffin Island, in the Bilot Supergroup, which is from the late Mesoproterozoic, about 1.1 billion years ago. Just to get you a feel for the rocks, these are sort of some of the common features that you see in um, proterozoic carbonate rocks, um, where you, you, know, you see nice evidence for wave ripples here. These are some little uh, rip-up breaches. And these are sort of direct seafloor precipitates that we think formed when the carbonate saturation state of the oceans was higher. And you're able to sort of directly precipitate carbonate minerals on the seafloor. Another place I've been working is in North China in the Zhejiang group in the, both the Gaozhuang and Wumashan formations. It's a little bit older, about 1.5 billion years ago. Um, these are some also common features that you see in proterozoic carbonate rocks. This is a structure called molar tooth structure. Uh, these are stromatolites, right? So they're thought to be the uh, evidence of ancient microbial mats that are sort of binding and trapping and precipitating sediments in these domal patterns. So, Done a number of work in, up on Bilot, uh, in the Bilot Supergroup in Canada and uh, over here in North China. Um, I've also supplemented that data set with a number of samples from previous field work. I did some work in India. We're working on some samples from the Harvard collections in uh, Siberia, as well as from Australia and some other collaborative connections. Um, so what I've done here is a little bit different, right? Because we're trying to get at a billion years of time here. So we're not going to get the detail of what happened on a, on a short time scale like we did in the Devonian. Here, I'm going to say, I'm sure there was a lot of variability, but I just want to get a general baseline. What was it like during this time? So I did a compilation of uranium isotope data through this interval here, from about 2 billion, 500 million years ago. 
So there's a lot of noise here, right? And, um, and that makes sense. This tends to be a bit of a noisy proxy in general. Even you saw in the Devonian, there's a good amount of scatter in those curves. And so there's clearly evidence for periods of more widespread anoxia and less widespread anoxia, right? Um, through a lot of these different formations that we measured. So what I tried to do here is take more of an aggregate approach right, and look at each of the different formations, the different time periods that were kind of a snapshot of sampling. Took the median for that formation and I plotted here the 25th and 75th percentile um, for the values so, so we can sort of descriptively show what's, what's seen here. So if we come in there, what we see is that the values for the middle Proterozoic here kind of sit in the range between minus 0.4 and minus 0.5 with some intervals where it goes down lower. So the median for the entire data set is around minus 0.4. And that's really weird because that's pretty oxic looking, right? And it's thought that the Proterozoic Oceans must have been more anoxic than the Paleozoic Oceans, right? Because if we go back to our lower Devonian from the previous study, we were sitting down at minus 0.6, minus 0.7. So could the middle Proterozoic oceans before the evolution of animals actually been more oxic than the early Devonian oceans? That seems weird, right? And it, and it doesn't actually jive with a lot of other lines of evidence. So this is where we sort of highlight you know, what different proxies can tell us, what are the strengths and weaknesses of different proxies. Um, and I'm going to show you in a minute why there are some sort of ambiguous interpretations in this particular case. Another way that we can look at this is I plotted our data in a histogram. This is the modern Bahamas, right? So our Proterozoic data are lighter than the modern Bahamas. So that's telling us it's more anoxic than today. That makes sense, right? But again, we're heavier than at some of these other times of anoxic conditions you know, during the Phanerozoic. So this is that Permo-Triassic extinction. The values are down here, right? And again, like the lower Devonian that I studied in the previous one, they were down here. So, so our Proterozoic is somewhere intermediate between those, somewhere between this modern and somewhere, and then those more anoxic conditions in the Devonian and Permo-Triassic. So, so the point is, how do we actually explain this, right? And if we um, do some of this modeling again, um, this paper we're about to submit, so I've got the modeling kind of more down, right? So. Um, we've done a number of different types of models here looking at the range of seawater values. This would be my estimate for the Proterozoic seawater. And then the amount of seafloor covered by anoxic or euxinic sediments, and then sort of changing these different model parameters to see the sensitivity and stuff like that. The point being here, though, is no matter what you do in all this model space, you can't get much more than 40% anoxic oceans, no matter what you do, right? And if you take the most reasonable values, which is what I've got over here on the right side, you come up with a maximum seafloor anoxia of 27%. But for the Devonian, which we looked at a few minutes ago, I was coming up with 46. So that, again, that seems weird that the oceans were more oxygenated at this time than they were later, after the evolution of animals. So how can this be explained? Um, let's go back to this system again and just look at some of the, the way that we look at this, right? So again, the utility of this system is built on the fractionation during anoxic sedimentation. If you look at it, though, our understanding of that is based on a very specific type of anoxia. Everything we've measured today from the Black Sea, the Sonich Inlet, the Framvjarn Fjord, are from what we call euxinic environments, anoxic conditions that also have hydrogen sulfide. So maybe it's actually that the type of anoxia matters, because in the early oceans, in the Precambrian oceans, we think that anoxia was more associated with iron-rich conditions as opposed to sulfide-rich conditions, because there was less sulfate in the oceans and other arguments like that. And the point is, we don't really have a lot of good analogs for what an anoxic and iron-rich um, situation is going to look like. And we're actually working on a lake right now in Michigan to help us answer that. But there's some evidence to suggest that this type of fractionation, this large fractionation, is generated in sulfide-rich environments only. And if it's 
iron rich and not sulfide rich, that fractionation might be a bit smaller. And that kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into our proxy, right? So then what we're really able to do here is um, constrain euxinia, right? We're able to constrain the amount of sulfide rich anoxia, but we might have trouble figuring out what the rest is, right? Um, so I think that you know this is this is sort of meant you know not to convince you one way or the other. It's just just to show that different geochemical proxies have their strengths and weaknesses. They're really good at telling us some things, but we need to know the weaknesses, you know, and and understand the ambigu ambiguities in other situations. So. With respect to this proterozoic data set, I think that the uranium isotopes suggest a low degree of euxinia in the mid-proterozoic oceans. But it's difficult to distinguish the redox state of the remaining seafloor using this proxy alone. So that's why you've got to tie in other proxies that are sensitive to more iron-rich anoxic conditions. So it highlights the limitation of this proxy when applied to the Precambrian, because we know that anoxia back then tended toward the iron side, not the sulfide side. Right? So it's, it gives us a couple of different sort of ambu ambiguous interpretations. So what we really need here is further study of iron-rich analog environments. As I said, I'm working on a project looking at a ferruginous or iron-rich anoxic lake in Michigan, which has been a fun project. Um, and it, being able to include those data in our models will get us to refine, you know, okay, is this oxic, is it iron-rich, what is it, right? OK, so basically, the point of that was to sort of show these two different scenarios, taking this proxy, applying it to do the two different times in Earth history, figuring out what it can tell us, what it can't tell us. So, so what are some of the broad conclusions? I think it's very clear to say that oxygenation of Earth's oceans was not unidirectional following the Great Oxidation event. There certainly was not a singular permanent rise in oxygen associated with the evolution of animals, right? Instead. Widespread marine anoxia persisted well into the Paleozoic, long after the Cambrian explosion, long after the Ordovician radiation. Life was doing real well on continental shelves, but there was still a large degree of ocean anoxia occurring, you know, maybe in deeper waters. There is, however, um, sort of there were hints of this before, and now our uranium isotope data, I think, are strongly suggesting that there was a major ocean, oxygena ocean oxygenation event that occurred in the early Middle Devonian, right? Whether this is the oxygenation event, we need more resolution to be able to tell that, but it clearly was a major event. And that the timing of it makes a lot of sense with those evolution of terrestrial flora, floras, the um, larger root depths for plants, the, the development of forests, right? The transition from the lower to Middle Devonian was a major transition in plant evolution, which affected biogeochemical cycles, weathering rates, atmospheric oxygen. And it makes sense that we might see an ocean oxygenation event, a global oxygenation event, right at that time in the early Middle Devonian. And then using this proxy, though, in other situations requires further refinement. So I think the, the take-home message is that you know, doing this right really requires sort of a theoretical understanding of the way the isotope geochemistry works, a, a, a system that's very well grounded in modern analogs and experimental studies. And then we go to the ancient rock record and, and we can see, you know, this is what we can say, this is what we can't say, this is how we can improve. So I think that this is sort of um, just meant as sort of a snapshot as to where we are in the sort of sedimentary metal isotope uh, geochemistry community in using these new proxies to give us, you know, sort of fundamental new information. Um, so with that, I basically take any questions, and thanks so much for hosting me again. This is in, uh, so this is in the Paranagate Range, about um, 100 miles north of Las Vegas. Yeah. Jeff, thanks. Yeah. That was really fascinating. Thanks, and, and so much to think about. Um, we've been thinking a lot about the, the Mesoproterozoic. Yeah. And I've got a, um, I'm trying to think through this process. You're using um, the, the delta U238 as in many isotopic uh, systems is a scalar. And so, so of course, the, one of the questions you have to constantly be lying awake at night, is there something else that could be affecting this? And there's something really weird about the mesoproterozoic. So, so I, I have two questions. Um, first, we know that uranium is concentrated often in granitic uh, 
terrains, and some some people suggest it's because you've got a uranium fluorine complexation mm -hmm. in fluids and so right. forth. So the first question is, is there any fractionation associated with that process? And the second thing has to do with rodinia itself. What Chow Liu has found yeah. is that you have this very distinctive um, trace element distribution, which may be related to a very extensive erosion of right. all that granitic terrain formed during Rodinia. So if you, in fact, have an isotopic fractionation in the granite, which right. generally would be a small signature, and, yeah. but all that granite went into mm -hmm. the ocean, would that have an effect on the ocean isotopic signature? Yeah. Good. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense for sure. So yeah, I mean, we know, right, I mean, I was looking at the Granville in the last in the over the last three days over the weekend. So it so the, obviously the formation of Rodinia and and the magnetism associated with that was monumental. Um, but I think people have measured um, the bulk uranium isotopic composition of uh, Granville granites, for example, or granites from across Earth history, and have found that it's relatively pretty much hits right on the nail. Um, and so, so, the, so there seems to be uh, a relative homogenization that occurs in those types of processes. So, so that, that gives us, I think, some confidence that, for example, you know, a 1.1 billion year old granite is not dumping in something different, right? Um, but I think the overall effect, though, of um, the amalgamation and breakup of Rodinia on, you know, element, you know, for example, could we have increased sort of the flux of uranium during the you know weathering of the Granville trains, for example, um, that would be something interesting to study. I'm not exactly sure how to get at that because the sort of what concentration ends up in your rock, whether it's a limestone or it's a shale, is going to be sort of a complex interplay between what you're bringing in and then how much is being sucked out by the anoxic sediments, right? So um, what we see generally, what we think generally, is that. Um, that the uranium isotope, comp uh, the, sorry, the uranium concentrations of the oceans themselves were probably low throughout most of the entire Proterozoic until the late Neoproterozoic. And we see that with a number of different metal, uh, metals. And we think that that's because, again, this doesn't, you know, we can debate what this means, but that more ocean anoxia meant more drawdown of those metals. So the, so the overall oceanic reservoir of those metals stayed relatively small throughout the Proterozoic, so maybe dumping in a bunch more when you're weathering off the, the Grenville granites and stuff like that, maybe it wouldn't show up in the record because of that drawdown or interplay. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I see what you're saying, and I think, I think, I mean, I think generally there's, we need to think more about the connections between sort of the end of the quote unquote boring billion in Mesoproterozoic, the Grenville and Rodinia tectonic events, and then sort of coming out the other side with a very different world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's kind of related to that and yeah. Connell's question about weathering. So the residence time, what you're referring to in the drawdown is, right. must be dependent upon the, the proportion of six plus to four plus uranium. So wouldn't, it, wouldn't the inference be that back in time, you have a more local signature because you're, any six plus that's coming from rivers or something is immediately dumped out of the of the ocean, or is there something else that indicates that there's a long residence time, this 400,000 year? Yeah, it's, it's certainly possible. I think it's, it's, it's probably more than likely that the residence time was shorter, right? And but particularly, um, I think that that, right, so that is, I think, less of an issue in the Devonian, right? Because, you know, if we look at sort of the, the size of the, inv the seawater inventories of these different metals, and this kind of s s uh, gets at what I was trying to say to Bob is that, um, a lot of these metals, like molybdenum and uranium, seem to have just been very low in the Proterozoic oceans because of wide-scale drawdown. So, like um, in Devonian, um, let's say euxinic black shales, they get a lot of uranium. So, there, so they, there clearly was a good amount of uranium in the Paleozoic oceans, right? Um, so, I think it's less of an issue in, in the Paleozoic, but it becomes a much larger issue in the Proterozoic um, when you know you. I mean, I, I think that that can be modeled. I haven't thought about it myself, but you can sort of probably get the residence time short enough that you're coming up on the ocean mixing time and, and potentially making this more of a local thing, right? So, so I mean, you know, does that, for example, explain um, some of the large degree of uh, variability that we see in single formations, you know, for example? And, and that could very well be the case. So I think that that, 
is something that needs to be thought about with, with a lot of these different proxies, but that is you know, another potential limitation is you need to have a large enough reservoir, exactly, that it stays well mixed, basically. This is probably just an ignorant question, but I wonder how about the fidelity of the oceanic sediments uh, for recording just what's happening in the atmosphere? Because presumably to have an anoxic environments in the oceans is going to depend on how much mixing you have between the surface and the deep ocean sure. and the productivity in the oceans. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and so, you know, for instance, could the continent, the, the positioning of the continents have a role to play in dictating what ocean currents are doing and how productive the ocean is. Um, and, and so taking into account where the oceans are, how they may be changing the, the currents in the oceans may have just as much to do with the relative abundances of anoxic and oxic environments right. as what's happening in the atmospheres. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, it's, uh, you know, for example, um, the, um, so, so we don't. So, based on like sort of what we think we know about atmospheric oxygen, you know, it it ro it seems to have risen from the Ordovician to the Silurian up into the Devonian, associated generally with the expansion of plants. But was there a spike in atmospheric oxygen right across that lower middle Devonian boundary? Probably not. That's probably uh, that ocean oxygenation event has got to be some type of um, sort of uh, sort of interplay between. Right, having all of a sudden, you know, having a larger degree of chemical weathering because of expansion of forests, bringing in a bunch of nutrients, right, which then drives primary productivity, which then drives local anoxia, but then drives organic carbon burial, which then drives atmospheric oxygenation. So there definitely is not, you wouldn't expect atmospheric oxygen and ocean, ocean oxygenation to go hand in hand. And I think that the whole sort of story that we're trying to tell about expansion and contraction of marine anoxia is, you know, is, is always an interplay between primary productivity, organic carbon burial, chemical weathering on land, and then, you know, with atmospheric oxygen as a, as a backdrop of that. Right, so there's, uh, and, and that's, um, you know, we do see evidence for uh, that happening. For example, so for example, right, um, here in the, in the East Coast, in the Appalachians, you go out to Pennsylvania, you get to, into the Devonian, you get a black organic rich rock that they're fracking to get uh, natural gas out of, right? And that is the, for sure, is the signal of some sort of local, because this Appalachian basin was relatively rest restricted with respect to the open ocean. So that's the signal of some sort of that exact process, that you probably dumped in a bunch of nutrients into this relatively restricted basin, generated a bunch of organic matter, decayed that stuff, right, or, or preserved it, right, and, and generated these sort of local dead zones, local anoxia. Um, and, 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 and again, it is that that can happen on the global scale, too. I mean, we, for example, with the Permo-Triassic um, anoxic event that may have caused the extinction, probably didn't have to do with a direct change in atmospheric oxygen. It's instead thought to be related to the emplacement of all these young volcanic rocks. Um, there were these huge uh, emplacement of these Siberian trap volcanic rocks, which they think all of a sudden weathered uh, really rapidly, dumped a bunch of nutrients into the oceans, drove productivity, and then basically drew down oxygen. So, so it was, you know, you can generate, as you said, sort of a massive ocean anoxic events without changing atmospheric oxygen. We think that that probably happened during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous as well, where we see the ocean anoxic events. So there's certainly a decoupling and, and you know, we need to be clear to say, you know, this is an atmospheric oxygenation event or an ocean oxygenation event, and this is what our proxy can tell us about that versus not that, I guess. It's a very nice talk, thank you. So the first question I want to ask is that uh, for the Devonian thing, uh, 
uh, it's generally accepted that uh, the uh, evolution of land plants actually lead to higher, higher weather rate. So in theory, you could have more uranium goes into the ocean at that time. So I'm thinking about maybe there is an alternative explanation for your increase of uranium isotopes, just like the oxidation state of the ocean stays the same, but you have more uranium goes into the ocean, then like, you know, it will increase. That's, I, I think that might be possible. You need to go back to the, I think we need to go back to the box model because you're assuming a steady state, which might be not. So the second question I want to ask is that uh, I'm just curious about this uranium, um, like, because as far as I know, uranium-6 goes into the carbonate structure. And you mentioned that then you have some anoxic event, and then it's, it's just, you know, the, the uh, isotope value goes up. So you, might, you must have some kind of uranium-4+. plus. Are they in the crystal structure of carbonate, or they are just from some weird uh, trees, knowing carbonate phases in your sample? I mean, if it, that's the case, you might need to, we might need to refine the uh, the dissolution method of the carbonate to look at what really makes this elevation. Yeah, that's that's a great point. So I the, I was totally with you on the last one because, right? So so the process of why you know that he rightly pointed out that the modern sort of sediments that are just sitting on the bank top in the Bahamas are actually heavier than the seawater is because in, in the modern Bahama bank top, when you dig down, there's actually sulfide in the sediments. Um, and they go anoxic, the sediments in pore waters pretty quickly below the sediment water interface. So what we think is happening is that right, it's, it's mainly U6 that ends up in the carbonate. But in that early diagenetic environment, you can end up incorporating some isotopically heavy U4. And where that sits, we do not know. Whether that sits in the lattice or whether or not that's sort of a surface complex or something like that. And I think you also uh, completely correctly pointed out that the way to get at that would be some sort of leaching um, you know, procedure where, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's something, right? So, so we've sort of had this argument in, in the community as to what's the best way to dissolve these rocks. Um, do we try and go down this road of hitting it with very weak leeches? Or do we just think in an old rock, we're just going to get all of it? That kind of thing. And, and there's, like, there's, there's a debate to be had for either one. But, um, but yeah, I, th I think a, a really interesting study would be to take modern Bahamas carbonates. And there's also a column chemistry that you can use to separate U4 and U6. And we've thought about doing that with some of our lake sediments as well. Um, so I think that. Yeah, um, trying to separate U4, U6, or try to use leaching on the Bahamas carbonates would be a very good idea. I agree. Great. Any other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again. All right. Thank you so much.